Ok. Ok, um, looks like um, GB is in a noisy place or also Morbe, Morbe, have you sorted out your mic issues? Yeah, you can unmute and introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Emmanuel Morbe, a student at the University of Yuba. So I'm very glad to be in this program. Thanks. Okay, nice to have you, Emmanuel. Okay. Hello. Okay, so uh, we are getting started with our with our first session. Uh, so this training is brought to you by Defy Head Now uh, as part of its fact checking and digital empowerment project that is being uh, supported by the Africa Digital Rights Fund, uh, managed by collaboration on international ICT policy for East and Southern Africa. And um, we'll be taking you through uh, basics of fact checking and basics of uh, online safety. So kindly follow the session keenly. And should you have any questions at any point, uh, do ask and we'll be happy to, to give you some answers to some of the questions or concerns. Just follow the presentation keenly, and uh, we hope that you will learn one or two things. Please confirm if you can see my screen. Are you all seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yes, I can see your screen, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so of course, before we start, make sure you're muted. Uh, you can write any questions or comments you have in the chat box, and then you raise your hand if you have something to say. Uh, there's a raise of, there's a, there's a function on Zoom that you can use to, to raise your hand, and we can be able to know who wants to say something. Uh, so here we'll cover what is fact-checking itself, what is the information disorder, the types of information disorder. We'll look at what drives misinformation information disorder, how to spot real and fake news and fact-checking, fact-checking criteria and examples of fact-checking successes. So we'll start with what is fact-checking itself? Like um, you may ask yourself, these people talking about fact-checking, fact-checking, what is fact-checking? So when we talk of fact-checking, fact-checking simply means to investigate an issue in order to verify facts. Um, you know, we are living in a society where a lot of information is shared. So in most cases, uh, we also take our time to try to find out whether truly the information is factual or is, is not factual. So we do this by carrying out an investigation on that particular issue. So this investigation that we are carrying out, the entire process is what we call fact-checking. And according to Wikipedia, fact-checking is a process that seeks to verify sometimes factual information in order to promote the veracity and correctness of that of reporting. So we fact checking can be two ways. One, we can conduct fact checking before or after text is published or otherwise disseminated. So this means that uh, sometimes like journalists, journalists mostly do fact checking before they disseminate or publish any information. Now fact checkers, what they do is they now try to conduct the investigation after the information has been disseminated to see that the facts are correct. What about verification? Verification is a process of establishing the truth, accuracy or validity of something. Yeah. Sometimes um, we, we already have a lot of, of information and then we want to find out whether, whether this information is complete and we want to establish the truth, the accuracy and validity of that information. So what? So the process of doing this is what we call verification. So uh, verification is a process that takes newsworthy information and checks its credibility and reliability before it is published or broadcast as news. So this verification thing is mostly done by content creators and uh, especially journalists. 
most journalists, before they publish their content, they, do, they take their due diligence to see that they verify the information that they get from their sources. First, they make sure that they quote their sources correctly and that uh, they are not quoting their sources out of context. So this process is what we call verification. So we would say here that the difference between fact-checking and verification is that fact-checking is done after a piece of information has been disseminated. But then verification is done before a piece of information is disseminated. So this is the difference between fact-checking. So fact-checking is just sort of investigation to verify facts, whereas verification is whereby we try to establish the truth, the accuracy or validity of information that we already have. So these are the key differences between fact-checking and information verification. So um, uh, now I want us to reflect on these two questions. Since you have understood, since uh, we have defined fact-checking, which is, which is a process that seeks to verify factual information to promote the accuracy of that information. And then verification is trying to establish the truth. Now, I am asking you this question. Has fact-checking been part of your writing or reading practices? You put your answer in the chat box. If it is yes, you write yes. If it is no, you write no in the chat box. How, do you make sure that you investigate information to confirm its factualness? Or do you try to establish the truth and accuracy of, of, of content before you share? Like some of you who are information officers, who are logisticians, even people who do logistics. Sometimes when you go and do your stuff related to your job, sometimes you, make, you seek to, to really confirm that the information you have is, is correct before you talk to your bosses. That is verification. So you put in the chat box, uh, if it is yes, yes, yeah, I see yes from K, I see yes from Lilija, but he's saying it's not often. Yeah. Where are the rest of the people? We are answering question number one. Has fact checking always been part of your writing or reading practices? Yes, yes, good, 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 yeah. And then, um, yeah, so number two, how do you know a content is inaccurate or has factual errors? Um, this is now to all of us. Uh, you can either write your, ans your answers in the chat box or you can, you can unmute and then tell us how, from, from, from your experience, how do you, you can put up your hand and then I should be able to point you out how do you know a content is inaccurate or the content has factual errors from your experience as a news consumer or as a, as a content creator? Yes, Kay. Okay, uh, thank you, Beda, for this session. Uh, in my own experience is that once a content has got no byline, definitely you know that this information has got inaccuracy. Uh, two, yes. when it is a photo, it has been manipulated. You can, so that you can see the exaggeration. Could be like a photo of a flooding, assumed to be in South Sudan, but at the background, you can see features that are not from South Sudan uh, location. You know that this information has got content that is, not, that is misplaced. Uh, thirdly, uh, the sources themselves in the, in the story or in the content, Sometimes it could be an opinion, it reflects on an individual's mind. Uh, two, it could be a content that has got no an expertise to back up the information. Uh, those are the three things that I, I consider in the information when, whenever coming with the conclusion that it has been manipulated. And for websites, sometimes you find... Perfect. Okay, thank you. No, you can carry on, you can carry on. I was just saying perfect. <laughs> Someone can pick it up from there, we'll come later. Okay, 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 great. Um, I, I earlier saw a hand from, there was a hand from someone, and the person has lowered the hand. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so these are very important insights uh, shared by, um, by K there, when the content has no byline, 
when even the sources used in the story are questionable, like some would say, uh, maybe someone says a well-informed source from the office of the president, or uh, without naming who that informed source is, and then that is, that is also uh, a red flag. And GB says most times when there's no clear source, especially online content. And then Boo Stella says, uh, I always fact checked. And when a content has no byline, too many anonymous sources for online content, I read also the comments. I also check the profile of the website. Excellent, yeah, these are all excellent practices that uh, can really, this means that a lot of you are already doing uh, fact checking, which is very good thing. It means that most of the things I will share here will not be new to a lot of you. So we say that a key to becoming a smarter news consumer is to understand the process of verification of each day's fact and decide for yourself if a story is solid or not. Because uh, just because maybe some producer or editor decides to run a particular story on, a, on an online platform or a news agency, doesn't mean you should blindly accept the judgment of the producer or editor. Because you as a news consumer, you need to pay attention to which is which when deciding for yourself if a story should stand up. So these are just key points of advices to all of us as people who consume news. And uh, so let's, let's look at an understanding of the information disorder. So uh, information disorder is a term we use for fake news, which is an umbrella term covering what is often called fake news, uh, which is bad information. And we say that the term often fails to adequately describe the problem. And information disorder includes both true and false content. And we categorize, we categorize this information disorder by intent desired outcome and truth or falsehood of that information. So these three things help us categorize fake news. The intention of the news, the desired outcome of the news, and the, and the, the truth or the falsehood of that uh, particular news content. And uh, when we do this, we get out with two categories. One category is misinformation. Misinformation is when the information is false and then you share it by mistake. It means that there's a goodwill. For instance, uh, <laughs> uh, when somebody decides to post uh, maybe something to do with this scam, and then other people decide to share it without knowing whether the information is false, um, this is the person is doing out of, out of goodwill because they want to share the information to their audience. And then we have disinformation. Disinformation is when the information is false, and then there's an intention to harm. It means that the person has an ill will, he has bad intentions. And then we have malinformation. Malinformation is, is when the information is true, and then there's an intention to harm, you see? So malinformation is now cases of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of pornographic videos. You know, these days people are crazy. Somebody will be naked in their room, and then will be taking a video of themselves. And then when somebody gets access to their phones, these videos get leaked. Like recently we have a videos of some lady called uh, Serena in, in, in Uganda. So her private videos got leaked. So that example is an example of malinformation. So these are the three, in, three categories of the information disorder based on intention, the desired outcome, and the truth or falsehood of that information. So again, okay, when we give now you detailed definitions, we could say that misinformation is when false information is shared, but no harm is meant. And it consists of viral messages that may be shared quickly without checking first. first. We see a lot of uh, information being shared like very quickly without people really checking. Like I remember, uh, was it one day or two days ago, I posted an old document that was, um, issued by the Minister of Higher Education, uh, talking about um, private universities that have been registered by the ministry. So because people wanted to sort of uh, help people in their network to see that they join legit institutions, people decided to, people started to share uh, that document. And then I think even the Minister of Higher Education had to come out and say, hey, that document is false. Uh, and people should, people should disregard it. So that is an example of misinformation. And then we have disinformation is when false information is knowingly shared to cause harm. You see, 
we know that the information is false, but then we just share it because we want to harm people. It is published with the, with the intent to mislead in order to damage an agency, an entity, or a person, and or gain financially or politically, often with sensationalist, exaggerated, or outrightly false headlines that grab attention. Yeah. So this information is, is now where I know that this thing is false. And then I know that when I push out this false information, uh, I'm going to gain something. For instance, maybe uh, I have issues with, uh, with K, then I want to damage K's reputation. I decide to fabricate a long article, say K is A, K is X, K is Y, K is Z. And then when this information is pushed out already, uh, K's reputation will be, will be damaged. So this is, uh, this is what we call um, disinformation. And then now malinformation is when genuine information is shared to cause harm, often by moving private information into the public sphere. While not false, this information that is shared in a way that can inflict harm on an entity, it includes leaks, data breaches, and personal information that is shared with the public to damage reputation. Yeah. You know, sometimes even organizations, Organizations, uh, information officers like Nancy may know that. Uh, uh, organizations have sometimes very confidential documents, yeah? And then sometimes people will decide to push out these confidential documents because they want to damage the reputation of the entity. So when they do that already, that is malinformation. And then sometimes we have private information of individuals pushed out into the public sphere that is already mal information. So uh, I hope that uh, we have an understanding of the information disorder. Is there any is there any clarification that anyone wants? If you need any clarification, please let us know in the chat box or you can raise your hand up. If everything is clear, we can move on. Let us look at an example of misinformation. Misinformation, let, let, let us look at this. Some of, so most of you might have seen that time when people decide to say that fingers are being sold, sorry, toenail, sorry, toes. You can sell your toe in Zimbabwe and you can get, uh, you can, you can get a lot of dollars. This story was even shared in, in South Sudan media, uh, social media, until uh, when, when I think even at some point, the, the person, the origin of this, this story was stressed and the person looks to have been apprehended and even appeared in court. So you will see DW Africa here say that Zimbabwe and David Kaseke, who made headlines by forcing that he was an agent trading in human toes, has appeared in court. He dismissed the claims as harmless joke, saying he was drunk when the video was recorded. In a video, he claimed that the joining fee is $200, while toes cost between $25 and $75. He is now facing criminal nuisance charges, you see? So this person posted this story as a joke, and people did not take time to check did not call people they know in Zimbabwe, and already this was misinformation. Because people were... Trying to show, hey, uh, it's a business deal. People, example of disinformation is this. Some of you might have seen the photo of this guy that was at some point uh, posted by 64 Tribes Press. They posted the idea of this person, that, uh, that this person is among those people who are instigating violence in the, that happened in Nimule, in Nimule at that time. So you will see that they, they posted both the ID, the work ID of the person and the genesia of the person. Like, uh, like, uh, like now you, you, will, uh, you will see that like people get to know a lot of details about him, what is his rank in the army and stuff like that. So this created a lot of discussion as you might have seen here in the, at the time this was a screenshot there were 74 shares, 220 comments, 155 uh, likes, and sort of other interactions. So this is an example. And this information alone will cause a lot of harm, even may try to spoil the relationship between this person and, and the institution he works for. So this is an example of this information. And these people who publish this, they have an intention, and their intention is to damage their reputation and even to put the life of the life of this person at risk. You see that? So this is an example of disinformation. And then we have malinformation. You might have seen that time uh, stories of John Frog and, uh, 
and uh, and lady caller wanting to wanting to to release private videos. So when you see that these private videos are leaked into the public sphere, this is already mal information because the information is true, but then it's not meant for the public. Yeah, it's not meant for everyone. But the people decide to leak them out. When they do this, that is mal information. And mostly, um, they they are using true information to damage the reputation of uh, a particular person or even an entity. And then, um, yeah, so these are basic examples that uh, we could give you so that you also have clear understanding of misinformation and disinformation. Um, Alain, I hope it's clear now. With that example, I hope it is clear. Yeah. Okay, great. So make sure you don't make sure you don't uh, you don't do private videos. <laughs> oh, you need to make sure your your phone is properly protected. <laughs> uh, and then, so what are the techniques? So, so you know these people that these people who perpetrate propaganda, uh, they are most of them are highly skilled. So they use a range of uh, of they use a range of uh, of the skills. To, to manipulate. They use a range of skills to, to achieve some of the things that they want. And um, one of the things they use, one of the technique they use is media manipulation. So media manipulation is where um, these people, they, they manipulate the media, that is the media entities like radios, newspapers, and influencers. Influencers, these are people like, um, when they say something, they create a lot of debate. It can be in your neighborhood, it can be online. And then um, they, they put people into discussing false and misleading story. So this influencer could be a celebrity, can be a news site or a politician. Uh, but second to best is to get an influencer or a newsroom to debunk the rumor. So it may sound odd, but by simply reporting the rumor, they are giving it oxygen and can fuel fire. So like, uh, like you've seen, sometimes uh, pe people, people bring out false information and then you realize that uh, there's a lot of uh, debate already. People will be discussing, how is this, how is this? Like recently, some of you follow online, you might have seen uh, issues to do with the, issues to do with the, issues to do with the, the Silicon Valley shares uh, is come. There has been a lot of discussions, a lot of debates around around on the social around social media platform and it was picked by by mainstream media and so so this is an example of media manipulation and people people take advantage of that and and seeing that this information reaches as many audience as uh, as possible and then number two we have imposter content so imposter content is where people use the names and logos of well-known organizations or figures to trick people into believing something is genuine when the thing is not genuine. Uh, also recently, you might have seen on WhatsApp, there's a link that EcoBank is doing some, EcoBank is giving out some money or something of that kind. Then you need to answer four or five questions. And then, but the issue is every time you will win, how many times you answer those questions, you will win. There's no competition where everyone wins. It doesn't work like that. But then that is an example of imposter content. They are using the logo and even the name of, uh, of an established entity like EcoBank to, to, to do that. Um, so that is an example of imposter content. Or some of you work for your organizations and then somebody decide to, to put out a, first, uh, a, very, a, a Facebook page that is fake with the name of your institution or even your name. Some of you are celebrities. And then people, people create cont uh, like pages in your name, and then they begin to to bring out false information that is already what um, that is already bad, and it will damage your reputation. And then we have weaponized content. So weaponized content is where uh, people take old imagery and they repurpose it to fit a new narrative. So this is one of the most common misinformation type we see, and it includes resharing all the content. Yeah, so this weaponized content is like the example I gave earlier. I said that uh, two days ago, I shared an old document that was published by the Ministry of Higher Education uh, 
I'm mentioning some of the universities, private universities that have been licensed by the by the government. So, but I, like in my case, I know repurpose it to feed a new narrative, and I know say the document was new. But then that is an example of a weaponized content because we are repurposing all the content to feed a new narrative. Or sometimes people take all the images of events that might have happened in this country or elsewhere, and then they bring it and say, hey, this is what is happening now. Or uh, sometimes people use pictures or videos of events that did not happen in, in, in South Sudan, and then they bring and say, hey, this one happened in South Sudan. So this is, these are three main techniques and tactics that are used by people who carry out disinformation campaigns. I hope it is clear. Yes. Okay, great. So let us look at the example of media manipulation. You might have seen this video of, of Minister uh, Majongdi that, at that time with the wife, and then people decide to you look at what has happened to the teeth. People decide to repurpose it. And then this was a video of... Uh... <laughs> so this is an example of media manipulation. So if you're someone who does not know, you may think that this video is real when it is not what? Sorry, this photo is real when it is not real. And then this was an example also of, um, of, uh, of sort of media manipulation in terms of, of photography. And uh, we have also job scams. This is where people sort of um, bring out um, genuine institution. Like this is, this person using the name of UNS, UNHCR, and this is using the name of Action Against Hunger and saying that these organizations want to employ thousands of people. So you will see that here, even here, you will see when you come down, uh, and one, you realize that um, they don't put links to their websites. Um, they would even you will see the email here is outlook.com most established institutions organization they don't use free email service like at gmail.com at outlook no they used um enterprise emails that are within their organization's name so when you see this and then you will also see that uh why does this organization they want to employ a lot of people like this thousands of people where are they going to be put even if they are to employ all these people and then, then no one will be without a job, yeah? You will have very many. And then you will see that there are a lot of red flags here. And you will notice that also, you may visit the, the website of UNHCR, or you may visit the website of Action Against Hunger, and you will not find these job ads. So here, this is an example of imposter content, where somebody uses a genuine institution and claim that those things, those institutions are doing something which is not real. And then also another example of imposter content is here, where somebody, for instance, this person created a Facebook page in the name of Johnson Juma Accord. And uh, in, even, in, even you know that many South Sudanese politicians are not online. Many of them don't have Facebook accounts, so uh, they, don't, they don't have online presence. So what happens is, uh, so what happens is uh, now some, some, some people take advantage of this situation. They now create Facebook accounts in the names of these politicians, and then they go to people's inboxes randomly. They say, hey, I am this, this, I am for a meeting, I have a car coming from here, the car is in Busia, now there's no fuel, you send $100, when I come back, you come to my office, and then blah, blah, and stuff like that. And then they give you a mobile number for either Uganda or Kenya, and they want you to send uh, money to it, you see? And then also there was a case where uh, this, the Bank of South Sudan was impersonated, and then the, the Bank of South Sudan is giving free SSP if you answer some questions. So these are examples of imposter content. And I see a question in the chat box that, uh, what are some of the purposes of the imposter content? So uh, in these cases, uh, Mr. Noel, like in the case of this job, this job ads, if you try to apply for this job, um, these people will write an email to you and they will tell you that uh, they are recruiting the people in their office in Kenya. And uh, as part of the application process, you should send some money via M-Pesa. 
So you realize that uh, their purpose here is to get money. And another thing they do is to get is to get your personal information. You know, when you apply for this job, for these jobs, you give them a lot of information, including your ID, including your telephone number, and stuff like that. Even they can use your phone number to, to sort of scam people, or they can use it for your phone number to hack into a social media account in case they are able to, to trust it. So these are some of the reasons why people carry out imposter content. Or sometimes it's just sort of um, to spoil the reputation of a particular brand, especially if you're already established. And then, um, and then an another case of imposter content is sometimes they just want to get, they want to drive traffic to their websites. They want to make sure that they have as many visits as there are, so that because some of them run ads on their website, so the more people visit, the more money uh, they make. And then most of them, like, like also the case of Facebook, where they use names of politicians and say, hey, we are sending you money like this. Um, they are making also what? Money from, from that. So these are examples of imposter uh, content. I hope that is clear. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. I want to ask about those people who are doing the. Then, when we come to the types of misinformation, if you want to, if you want to say something, please, uh, you can raise your hand first, and then we should be able to know who wants to talk or you put your comments in the chat box, I should be able to, to read. So we have the types of misinformation and disinformation. We have one, we have satire or parody. This is when there's no intention to harm. We're just trying to summarize the things that we have discussed. And then we have misleading content, where misleading use of information to frame an issue or individual. And then we have imposter content, when genuine sources are impersonated. And then we have manipulated content, when genuine information or imagery is manipulated to deceive. And then we have false context, when genuine information is shared with false contextual information. And then we have false connection, when the headlines, visuals, or captions don't support the content. So these are, this is just a summary of what I have been talking about from the beginning. So satire or parody is this, like uh, it's just sort of funny, like somebody say, I just went to the free bridge and the soldiers told me to come back tomorrow because the bridge is sleeping. This was when the this was when the freedom bridge was was inaugurated. You know, at some point people said there were soldiers, so the soldiers were were stopping people from using the bridge. So this person posted like this. So here the person has no in intention to harm, but this content has the potential to fool somebody if you don't uh, give it uh, attention to detail. And then we have misleading content. Uh, the use of information to frame an issue or, or an individual. So here we have, this was uh, when there was beef between Lady Cola and John Frog. We see a lot of write-ups here. So sometimes they just want to frame an, an, an individual so that people say this person is bad. And then we have fabricated content. This is when new content is 100% false and it's made to deceive and do harm. Like in this case, we have there was false news that Achaiwir wants to give all South Sudanese artists $2,000 each. And that this came after a group of her close associates informed her of the need to financially help the artist so as to push them to the next level. The project is spearheaded by her brother. So this was, this was false content. It was 100% false. And it was meant to, do, to deceive uh, artists. And it's likely to, to do harm, especially to the people mentioned here. When they don't fulfill this, people say, hey, these people are, don't keep up to their promises, you see? So this is an example of fabricated content. And then we have false connection. This is when headlines, visual or captions don't support the content. And when you look at this post, analysis of this post by Mary Boyoy, there, there are a lot of things there. First, she's saying that she's, uh, uh, she's in the UK already, and uh, this, this post was made in Nairobi, and again, she's saying bye-bye Juba. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of things here done that do not really match. So this is um, an example of a false connection, where things are within, within, uh, within this 
do not really do not do not really match you see this is an example of false connection and then here we have false context um, this is when genuine content is shared with false contextual information now you could see this uh, this is the picture of the bright stars and the president of the South Down football association and we have some some write-ups in uh, in arabic and stuff like that and then also we have manipulated content some of you might have seen this picture of uh, of lady caller where you, you might have seen the, your, are you seeing this red arrow here and uh, this is when genuine information or imagery is manipulated to deceive like uh, sort of it was even shared by Hodin Juba and uh, and first shared by MC Lomax who is uh, who is an artist so this picture was not the original picture it was manipulated to include uh, this thing here that has been put down here so this is an example of manipulated uh, content. Yeah, so I, th I hope that those illustrations like have given you a better understanding of uh, all the information points that uh, we explained earlier. I can still read a few comments. Um, is there a way we can stop this from continuing? We are coming to that. We are still doing an introduction. I see how can we make sure that we are not victims of imposter content? We are coming to that. Uh, South Sudanese still lack more knowledge about internet and safety from social media scammers. And um, is Silicon Valley a scamming company or is there little truth about it? I think investigations are still ongoing on the Silicon Valley and I think more information will be availed as time uh, passes by. So what are the red flags? You as a social media user, you as a content creator, Are you getting me? No. Yes, we're getting you. Yeah, we're getting you now. Are you guys getting me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're getting you. Better. Getting you. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, looks like looks like my connection got lost a little bit, but. Yeah, there is problem with the connection. Um, okay. Yeah, let's let, let's continue. Are you all seeing my screen? Title: Red Flags. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm seeing oh, yeah. the screen. Yes, we are seeing it. Okay. Looks like there's a problem with the connection, right? Yes, there yeah, is. But, but at least now are you, are you we are getting, getting me? you. Yeah, right now we are getting you. Yes, I'm. I'm getting you also. Getting you clear, Vika. Me too. I'm getting you. I'm also getting you right now. I can hear you. I'm getting you also. Red flag. Arik, um, can you pick up from here? I am having issues with my connection. I, I don't think you guys are getting me. Yeah, actually, no, but now we are getting you. We are getting, We're all getting you, Vida. Yeah. Everyone's hearing you. I can hear you, but I can't see your screen sharing. Uh, you all can hear me, right? Can you hear me? Can you hear it? I'm getting you. Uh, 
All right. Uh, Hello. Yes, Vida. This is Manuel. This is Manuel Marvel. Okay. So, hello to all of you. Uh, maybe since Bella is not coming back, let me pick up from that. We're all good? Yeah, we're good, so, man. Yeah, so, so let me see yeah. how I can no, share I don't my screen. I don't need to, to send me on the random number. Vida? Vida? Yes, please. Uh, it's a Guys, just a moment, I am sharing my screen. Right. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, I'm seeing yes, your I'm, screen. I'm seeing. I'm also seeing. <laughs> All right. Online safety. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. yeah, so uh, uh, I introduced myself early on. My name is Robert Eric. Uh, I am a cybersecurity professional and I I am the coordinator for Septicom South Sudan. So for those of you who don't know, Septicom or are hearing it for the first time, Septicom is an is a cybersecurity uh, program that is also under DeFi, like 211 check. So we mainly deal with uh, uh, doing incident response to the old public and uh, uh, helping people uh, how to stay safe online through trainings like this one and also um, in person walkthroughs in case maybe you come across or maybe your account is hacked or uh, someone is impersonating you like some of the things uh my colleague vida said so mostly we report to facebook and then we take down those accounts that are uh doing the impersonation so uh, online safety is paramount because uh we all agree that nowadays uh um online or internet or technology has become a huge part of our life. So uh, we just can do without it uh, in all aspects of life, be it uh, education, uh, whatever work that you're doing. So there are people who are online for their own reasons. And uh, that's why this session is important. So it's not uh, so deep. Cybersecurity is vast, but I'll try to make it really understandable to you through this one. So one, uh, on the table of cotton, what is cybersecurity? Uh, major principles of cybersecurity, and then skill building, they will move through on how you can see a website that is not secure, uh, how you can make your password strong, how you can remember them easily, how you can recognize and avoid online scams of all nature, especially those that come uh, through social media. So uh, number one is uh, why do we, what is cyber security? First of all, can anyone, can anyone say it? Like not through the comments, but like say it. What do you understand by cyber security? Have you ever heard it then? Yeah, how do you understand it in your own? Assuming you're explaining to me as a layman. <laughs> Please, can we see your face, facilitator? Don't worry, you'll see my face at the end of the session. <laughs> uh, so can someone say, 
what do you understand by cyber security? Please. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yes, Morbe, you, you want to try? Yeah, I want to try. Cyber security is, is how to work on the internet safely. That's how you understand. Yeah, the other person. Yeah, I say cyber security is the way to work safely in the internet. We understand. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, so cyber security is, is a confidential. Yeah, yeah. That is to be confidential. Then you have to also availability, and then integrity on the online service. Oh, you don't need to do. So, so, uh, cyber security is uh, a set of practices make sure systems or information is protected on the internet. So, as Morbe said, that's another way you can say it. So, that's a good one. So, the major principles of cyber security are only three. One, that guides it or that makes it meaningful or that uh, makes people want to uh, put those practices in place so that they are observed is one. Uh, one is called, it's called the CIA trial, CIA. CIA standing for different words. So one, C stands for confidentiality. Confidentiality means that you should not share information with anyone that is not authorized to see it. Yes? Yes. So if it's your pin or your Facebook password, then why? It's only you is authorized to, to see it or to know it. So you shouldn't share it with anyone. At least the meaning of confidentiality. Integrity means uh, not uh, like modifying information without authorization. So, for example, if it is a, uh, a news maybe headline or a news article that is talking negatively about, or that is maybe criticizing someone, and then the person who is being criticized gets an access to that uh, website, he can change the information, modify it, suit him, which is not right. So you'll be like informing because of the temper of the original information. Then availability to make sure that the information you're using should, uh, that is needed should be available at all times. For example, take an example of your ATM. So with your ATM, uh, you shouldn't go to the ATM, you put in your card and then like the power goes off. That is like a using availability. So you should make, uh, you should, Access that service whenever you need it, or if it is information, you should access it at all the time. Yes. So those are the main principles that you should be observed. Then, um, so why do we concern about? I mean, why do we need to be concerned about online security? Because we share personal information that we want to be private. Earlier on, Vida told you that there are some people who want personal information aside from money. Okay. All right. Uh, I am not audible enough. Am I audible now? Yes, yes you I are. I can get you now. Okay. All right. So, uh, so some uh, Vida say earlier that there are people who want uh, those on who uh who do the impost or whatever. Like one is financial, then the other one is personal information. So your personal information, you might ask yourself, how is it beneficial to the other person? Like that is not his name and so on. So there's something called identity theft. So if I have your personal information, I have your name and have so on. Apart from maybe trying to compromise your social media account with that personal information, I can just create uh, an account using your name and your pictures 
since I know your name and everything and even your year of birth. And then I can, it is very common here, like, and then I can start either writing information that is not uh, in relation, I mean, in line with your personality. Maybe starting abusing people, start abusing the government, like putting you in danger, who, the person like who is using that profile. So maybe the government might start tracking you, thinking that you're the one writing those defamatory uh, posts about them. Or they can just use your profile that they have created to make money, like from people asking them that, please, I, I, I have. Yeah, they are moving, Vida. Like, uh, like maybe they are having an accident that they have been arrested and they need money. So people who know you by name and your pictures will start sending the money and they'll think that they are talking to the right person. So uh, that is what they can do with your personal information. So sometimes they get one personal information and not money directly. Yes. So, and then uh, I say to protesters might try to gain access, which is uh, very common because most of us use our phone numbers as passwords or our year of birth plus a name as passwords. So someone can just try to gain access to your account and then do the combination. And if it works, then they are in, then they can start impersonating you and ask people directly from the account that people have been following. So. Uh, taking loans using your name, begging using your name, writing stuff that are uh, not associated to you using your name. So that's why you should be concerned. And then uh, personal uh, data is accessible to others. Uh, let's say device work properly and are free from malware, let's say. So that's why it should be important for us to uh, attend such trainings. Now, why does a website need to be secure? The website needs to be secure for one. The website can be used for all manner of malicious programs. Second, the website can be used to arrest your personal information. And what do they do with the personal information? So if you're going to enter personal information, you want to keep your but I'm talking about personal information. Uh, what 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 is personal information? What do you understand? What is personal information? Tell me. I hope you can hear me guys. What is personal information? What is personal information? Yes. Yes. Yes, I've seen your hand. Noel or who? Yes, Noel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, to me, to, to me, personal information, these are, these are, these are information that uh, you, are supposed actually they're supposed to be only consumed by the individual owner, but not example, meant for the public. Example. For example, for example, my ATM, my ATM card uh, number, pin number, yes. is only consumed by me, but not the public. Yes. And then Hello. Hello, another example, please. So like personal information, uh, okay, the other person has raised hand, Emmanuel Morbe, uh, Moses. Okay, let's get a lady so, now. Leng. 
Thank you so much. Uh, personal information, according to me, uh, it's an information that belongs to an individual. And uh, if you are to share it out, now it becomes an uh, public information. For example, we have uh, an example of uh, maybe if you have gone out with your husband, with your friend, chilling around somewhere, that information when it's leaked out, it is a personal information that they are not supposed to be leaked out. Thank you. Okay, actually I want you to be giving examples. For example, your name is personal information, right? Right, do you agree? Karen? Uh, yes, Nancy. Nancy? <laughs> Yeah, um, examples of personal information, this could be like your email address, your phone number, maybe if it's a database for a hospital, your, your medical records, it could even be your ID, the, the laptop ID, or the IP address for the laptop. So I think this is all personal information. Can I give another example of yes, personal yes. information? Yes. Yeah, one of the one of the personal information are uh, like my chats, my chats with my wife. These are these are personal information. They are not meant for the public. And uh, maybe private pictures that maybe we took, uh, maybe nude pictures that maybe I said we said with my loved one. They are not meant for the public. But now when they are leaked out and then shared. Now it, it becomes a public one. Okay, that one is called sensitive information. Okay. So, like, uh, what you said is correct. So, uh, sensitive information, credit card information, employ employment record, photographs, internet protocol or IP address, like she said, voice brain or facial recognition, biometrics details. Uh, location information from mobile devices because it can reveal uh, activity patterns and habits. And uh, uh, let's say phone number, date of birth, uh, your name, your signature. Uh, your signature is where you have someone like signing a document and sign on your behalf. A uh, really dangerous and you guys are part of a uh, uh, Someone will take the signature with the dress, couple years back, and uh, it was a big, big trouble. So, uh, we were later released because of South Africa. Then your house. Yeah, we are not. Yeah. I'm saying someone. Maybe you heard of a story of someone who uh, okay. took the president's signature and like took a lot of money from the bank using the president's signature. So you can see the damage he caused. So your signature is uh, is your personal information and you shouldn't share it. So yeah. You can hear me now? Anyone not hearing me? Yes, we can. I can. You're loud and clear. All right, perfect. Yeah, so those are the examples of personal information of which each of them can cause you problems in, in, in case they get into the wrong hands. So yeah. So I was saying that a website can be used to address personal information. Then a website can also be used to host malicious uh, software. Then malicious can, software can then harvest personal information like credit card details, like uh, your passwords, and so on. And in the end of the day, see most the, the 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 common thing with cyber crime is that the goal is usually one. Uh, the major goal is one is financial gain. Then the other one, like maybe if someone is just trying to to make fun of you. Uh, or to just uh, like uh, revenge, yeah. Or maybe if it's a big 
complicated hack then. That is gibberish. And he has raised up his hand. It is one I I don't know. I don't know who is this person, but you should write your name properly. So how do you know that a website is secure? Mostly uh, there is something called uh, SL, SL, SL certificates. So it given to every website, it's the security part of it. So a website with a SL certificate, you will see that it's using a protocol HTTPS. As you can see the padlock, can you all see the padlock? The padlock icon in the, in the, in the screen up there. Can you see it? Please say. Hello? Yeah. Hello. I can like, see the yeah, padlock. Yeah. We can see it. Yeah. So if you can see the, the, the padlock, the padlock is like it is secure. It's just indication that that website is secure and it is using a uh, hypertext transfer protocol secure. So there are two protocols. There is this one and then there's the one that will come after. The one will come after is just HTTP without S. And usually the padlock is not even there or the padlock is there, but it is open and it is red like giving an alert that this is uh, danger. So when you go to a website and website and then you see that it is having the padlock on and you see this HTTPS, then yeah. It means that any information that you enter on that website will not be seen by a third party or anyone that is trying to see like what is moving. It's like, uh, to give an example, it's like, uh, you see, when, uh, when there is a pipe water, or water in the pipe. So you know that liquid is moving there, right? But you do not know like, uh, or maybe if you see there is a pipe down and maybe you are not told that this this pipe is for water, you know that yes, there is something moving there, but you will not see if it is moving there at that time or when. So this is like a layer or a pipe of information. So whatever information that passes here, passes through a pipe as long as this padlock is on. So anyone that is sitting in the middle or any cyber criminal that is sitting in the middle trying to see the information you are passing, they will not be able to see. They will just see gibberish information like this person. Is the information uh, like this person was put? Uh, I don't know. I don't know who this person is, but uh, that's just know what he has. So uh, it will just be a bunch of characters that do not make sense, you understand? So it is even here, maybe you can see it now clear. HTTPS dot dot website dot com, depending on the domain you're using. So and then you can see this, the one with a uh, red, HTTP and then dot 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 www.website.com. This one is not secure. So this is the easiest way you can identify a website that is not secure. Why is uh okay someone say why is that HTTP is in green color is in black color? Okay. <laughs> The website is just a name, yeah? But uh, the green color is just like in, uh, telling that it is secure. This is safe. So green usually stands for safety or maybe something that is complete. Yeah. So the, the color of the, 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 color of the, 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 the website name doesn't really matter. But what matters is the protocol, which is the HTTPS and then the padlock icon, whether it's there or not. Yes. Oh, you guys want to ask something? 
Okay, great. I don't know your network. Your network. Your network. Uh, my brother Jack Dienga Tech. Can you remove the video, please? So now, uh, let's talk about personal accounts. Uh, have you like, uh, have you created an online account? What kind of account have you created? Why would someone create an account? So for example, like you have a, a Google account, that's why you're able to access this training. And um, I believe most of you on Facebook, like someone earlier would say that uh, they are telling me the capacity as a social media user. So, uh, why do you create an account as an individual? Like, why don't you just get that one of your uh, family member and then be using it to contact them? <laughs> to contact other people, just like the way you do with the phone. So with the phone, you can just say, ah, please, uh, like if you don't have credit, say, please give me, uh, give me your phone, let me call someone and then talk to that person and the message is passed and it's okay. But on social media, like, Everyone must have their own account. So, so why is it so? Some ideas, please. Come on, guys. Let's be interactive. Why don't we use someone's account? Why do you create your own? My network is now. Hello? Hello? If your network is bad, yes, Alan. Yes, Alan. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, according to me, be using somebody's account. Do not feel free. First of all, there are some other kind of information that maybe your friends, your colleagues will be sending you. You will have that fear that uh, this person is going to have an eye into it. Oh, if this person is to see this kind of uh, message in this side, uh, how will the person feel? So you feel, uh, according to me, I don't feel it is a nanny. I feel that uh, it's it, it, it impresses me. You don't feel free when you're using, but if you have your own account, you can use it so freely because nobody's going to have access into it unless you give uh, the opportunity to that person to have access to like uh, knowing the password or yeah, something of that kind. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, so like, you know, uh... <laughs> Having your own account, like ensure that uh, your privacy is respected and uh, the information you share is only seen by you only. Yes, Noel. Yes, Noel. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I had wanted to say that uh, creating an account and or using someone's account it's a it's a crime and then it is not also easy it's a crime because uh, even creating it you needed the personal details of that person and if you don't have you it, you find it it's hard to create and by using someone's account it will also look it will also be like okay you're doing impersonation because 
you're trying to be someone yet you cannot be complete completely that person because uh you may be using the name of the person but if i call in using <clears throat> someone's account and then the picture of me is different but then the name is again different so i think it's not easy it's better to have your own personal because at least the details are easy you put your own personal and then also you can be respected yeah and it doesn't put you in a, in a criminal act Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so you create personal accounts so that your information is only accessible to you. That's what Alan said. Again, uh, I... okay. That one, that is how you, uh, I think you have learned how you can organize a, a website that is secure and the one that is not. You can look at the, the padlock or dobla. Yeah, uh, it's the easiest way. And then, like, you make sure that the information you're putting there, it's, uh, you're putting, it, maybe assuming if it's an online site where you want to buy something, and then you're taken to that website and you want to put in your credit card information. You have to check first. Because the moment you put it in the website that is not secure, then someone will start sharing your credit card with you and start buying stuff with you, which is very bad. So now let's talk about passwords. Yeah. So uh to you, uh okay, it's already given there. Strong password is the one that is hard to guess. And earlier on when I started, I mentioned that. There are people who use their, uh, their date of birth uh, plus their name, plus the phone number, plus the name of the boyfriend, plus the name of the wife, or the name of anyone that is so special to you, or the name of the sports team. So if you're a Man U fan, you put Man U or Chelsea or Arsenal and Liverpool and so on. Or maybe if you support the local league, you do the same as well. So, <laughs> so, uh, so to you, uh, a password, is, your password should be the one that is hard, should, should be hard to guess. And if you are, I've, I've, I've mentioned and if you're using one of the passwords that I've said, uh, then please from today on, you change. So how do you come up with a strong password? How do you make it strong and secure? So password must contain at least eight characters. That is the minimum. If you're very lazy, you can't keep a lot of letters. And at least one uppercase, one lowercase, and one letter character, numeric character. So there are a lot of numbers on the keyboard, both on the phone and the laptops or the computers. And they're like, two or is it 36 symbols? So just combine uh, letters, with at least capitalization. But nowadays, I, some website even give you guidelines of the strength of the password that you should use. So if you are signing up, they'll say, ah, use at least this strength. If you have not reached like the strength level that they want, they will not allow you to proceed to the next phase of your signing up. So, uh, so they'll just like make sure you put in the right password. But the one that you can remember and the one that not anyone can guess. Yes. So it's not like you combining your phone number and your name because they requested you to put a long password. So you put your name and then you put your phone number together. Someone will guess. Hackers know that people are late. So I say numbers, uppercase and lowercase. And symbols such as punctuation marks, uh, dollar sign. How can we know that the password is strong or weak? Okay, we're moving there. Such as, for, and I mentioned how a, pass, a weak password look. Your name, your phone number, your date of birth, your date of birth plus your name, the name of the girlfriend, the name of the wife, the name of the husband, the name you love, the name of your mom. 
even the name of your daughter will be in your uh, yeah. So let's go tips for strong passwords. Don't use common words like password. Actually, people are lazy, so someone will just use passwords as a password. So they say, I am using this because I don't want to ever forget it. Don't include personal information. I mentioned of your name, your phone number, the name of anyone, your date of birth. Don't do that. Joe and Cecilia, please enable your audio. I see that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, don't use the same password on multiple accounts and sites. So I know there's some of you now that are using the same password on Facebook, on Twitter, if you're on Twitter, on Gmail, because you don't want to be remembering too much. But the disadvantage is if one account is hacked, hackers know that people are lazy. They try to use the same password for all the accounts that you are online. And then they might have hacked the account that does not have so much information. And then they will, they will try to use it until it works on the account that has so much of your information. Or maybe assuming it's your banking uh, site or your PayPal account, that would be disastrous. So use each password for each account. Don't repeat the, the, the same password for all the accounts because if the other one is hacked, at least it might be the one that is not having so much information for you. So, and then from there you will uh, be keeping your information safe. Don't share with others, keep them private. Don't give your girlfriend or boyfriend uh, your password to show love, because he might be reckless with it. Uh, we're coming to phishing, sir. So don't share the password, yeah, because you might be serious keeping it private, but if you share it with the other person, the other person will be recognized with it, and then you will be hacked, and so much personal information will be exposed. So don't share your password. Password is secret. So tips for strong password continuation. So what you should do, make the password longer. Uh, so don't use password like one, two, three, up to 10. Uh, or 20 depends on the keyboard and then the example has been given there of something that is hard a mixture of both symbols and uh, letters and numbers use short phrases that are easy to remember so there is something called a pass press a pass press is is the common thing nowadays or it's something that is stronger so for example, you can see down the cow help make cheese. That is a statement. Can you forget that? So assuming you're using that as your password, you'll never forget that. You just know that cow help make cheese. Or you can say, I love South Sudan. Like with a percentage of your choice. If it's 20%, then that's not bad. But you're making a password that you will not forget easily. So how do you keep track of passwords? Because I said, don't repeat the same password for all the accounts. And I said, uh, make them longer. So you'll be like, how do I remember that if I can't, if I can't uh, repeat them? So there are two ways. You make one as a praise, like cows help make cheese. Cannot forget that one. And then password software. So there are password managers. A password manager helps keep for you your password. The three examples of password managers. One is uh Wadded. And uh there's Bitwarden. There is a last pass. There is dash lane. There is key pass. 
So those are some of the, I put them in the chat box. Those are some of the password manager features. So password manager, what it does, it keeps, it allows you to create an account. And then you will be remembering only one password, one master password. Then under one master password, all the passwords, all your account will be kept there. So uh, whenever you're logging in and you uh, set up your, uh, your password manager, it will just auto fill your password for you. Password managers also even help you create strong password if you can't. So they can create for you strong passwords, keep them for you. All you just have to do is remember that one must password. Yes. So password store in save and your place. Instead of writing an actual password, I write something that tells you remember it. So that is if you want to write it in a notebook. So don't write the real password. Write something that helps you remember it. But don't write down the password. So like a hint. Yes. Then password somewhere, I've explained them. Phrases, Carl tells makes cheese. To give an example, you can make any phrase that will help uh, have a strong password. Yeah. So using the password requirement in the sign up form have above create a strong password that meets the criteria. Uh, not all sign up or website require that, but the others that requires you at least to make sure you have a strong password. Then now let's go to online fraud and stuff. So let me ask you like, have you like come across any? online scam recent or on even since you started using the internet have you ever some of the most common types in group yeah have you ever come across it one please share your experience just one or two people before we proceed No one, that's very good then, if no one has been scammed among you. So online fraud and scams, they start with phishing. Phishing is just uh, a way of, is an, okay, phishing is under social engineering. Social engineering is an art of deception of trying, they feign uh, to, to be from someone, to be someone legitimate and then the main goal is usually to is usually to make you put in personal information or collect personal information or make you perform an action you would not do in normal circumstances. So they play or they try to trigger your curiosity at all costs so that you so that you put in personal information. So fishing is just like fishing, like the real fishing. So usually you can see with this rod, you put it in the water if it's fishing. And then from there, you, uh, the fish will hook it thinking it's food and then the fish will be full out. So this one, they, they hook you with information that will trigger your curiosity. And then from there, uh, the moment you click it, you will become a victim or you will download the virus that they wanted you to download. So social engineering is like someone faking someone, then like, yeah. For example, uh, the example that Bida was saying, giving before about people impersonating politicians and using their pictures and their names to ask for financial favors. So that is social engineering. Yeah, they just, it's an art of deception online. So you can see with this picture or the illustration, this is not his real face. He's using someone's face 
to make sure this person giving their details or the personal information or the credit card details. So what exam examples have you experienced? How can you help stay safe from fraud? So tips to organize a scam. One, have you heard of the person or the organization? Always ask yourself that. Can you tell who the email message is from? Does the email have a mistake? Are they asking for your information? Are they trying to rush you into quick action? Is it too good to be true? So uh, mostly, uh, did I also mention about, uh, give an example earlier of uh, a competition where everyone wins. <laughs> And sometimes they make you win competition that you did not participate in. You just get a congratulation. You have won this. And then you don't remember initiating, I mean, like that or participating in the act. Uh, and then they say you just won. How, how do you win? How do you win when you didn't participate in the competition? So that is a example of is it too, is it like too good to be true? And then the amount also. Is that how business work? If maybe you're doing transaction and then like they're giving you a very ridiculous discount. Like, yeah, like they know you, they actually don't know you. So they're just trying to scam you. Then are they trying to rush you into an action? For example, the most common thing with this one who do impersonation on Facebook, they'll tell you, please do this to uh, before it's late. Uh, or if it's someone that is pretending or using someone's profile that you know, they say, I am in hospital. Please, I am dying. Please help this, 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 this. So they are usually having some sense of urgency so that you try to act quick and do the, perform the action they want you to perform before you come back to your senses or before you start asking people, please have a look at this. Someone is doing this to me. And then the, the people around you tell you, no, no, this is a scam. So that's why they usually too quick. And then they ask for your personal information. So there is no a brand or a company that has uh, for your information on, especially on email. It doesn't happen. Yeah. So uh, unless you're very sure of this, but please never give in your inf personal information via email. Usually emails of scammers usually have a lot of mistakes. So be very, very keen to examine each one or the header, is it coming from someone you know? Is this the first time you're talking? And what is the person saying? Like, studying the email headers is very important. Have you heard of the person before the organization? Uh, if it's someone that is new and then they just contacted you and they're uh, asking you to perform an action, please be very vigilant. Okay. So here you can see, can you tell who the message is from? Let's be interactive, guys. Can you tell who the email is from? What is the email address this email is from? They say here they are scaring you that your account, your PayPal account has been centrally restricted. We recently asked you to take an action on your PayPal and look like we didn't receive the requested response. Why is your account restricted? We have found suspicious activity on the credit card link to your, you must confirm. So this is a way, this is phishing. This is typical phishing. This is a way that they will, uh, they will say that maybe uh, your account is locked. So in the, in the, in the, when you are now trying to panic, to see that your account is not uh, locked, they will ask you to click on this uh, blue, uh, link so the moment you click click there they will ask you to verify and then uh, as you're trying to verify you put in your login details including your password and then that's how they get your password so you can see from here there is this what from account that starts with q q l a yeah then at at googlegroups.com. Can you see that? Can you start that 
closely. Another one will tell you that congratulations, uh, you found confirmation. We have been trying to reach you to deliver your $750 cash up gift card expiring soon. Complete the necessary step and get your money. Assuming you did not participate in this. And mostly like you are likely that you never participated in this. So how do you know that someone, I mean that you won, you never participated in this? How? You just click here. The moment you are trying to confirm, they'll be asking you for your, uh, uh, how do they say, your uh, your credit card number, your pass, your name, your ID, and so on. You see that? I'll give you examples that are familiar to you. So here that your account needs update. For example, you could get an example, I mean, uh, an email from Facebook and it's telling you that uh, your account has been hacked. Please, uh, please log in to confirm if you still have access to your account. So you will be panicking and trying to find out if actually your account has been hacked. Then from there, you will be giving out your details. Another way uh, that is common is that maybe you have been seeing uh, messages coming from MTN that please give me your password so that I can connect you to free data. That is typical social engineering. So the moment you give them your password, then your account is gone. And MTN or any reputable organization will never ask for your personal information. Uh, like password, so uh, that's why you should be very, very careful. So, do's and don'ts for voice caps give out, uh, don't give away any personal information, don't reply to or engage with fraudster, don't click on any links or buttons, download any files or attach. Don't do that. Do be skeptical. Read emails carefully. Look up information on your own. Like make research. So if it is a certain institution, for example, the the ongoing uh, Silicon Valley or any other. Uh, the, the most tricky thing about Silicon Valley is that they're using a name that they haven't used before. That a uh, new way of scammers now. So most scammers use the same name, and then. People who have been victims before will always complain. You know, they, 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 they. So you write the name of that institution, then you say it's come, and then you search on Google, and then you find out the reviews about them. So don't give any personal information. So assuming you click on a link and it gives you this, just go back. Don't reply or engage with process. And then don't click on any link or button. Assuming there is a link like this, don't click on it. Don't download any files or attachments that they have provided. Assume they have given you an uh, attachment here. Please don't. You, attachment could be embedded with malicious software or virus that could delete your files or collect personal information on your computer. Be skeptical. Always verify that you're talking to the right person. Do read emails carefully. Make sure that you read each email carefully. Read the header, read the address. Is it the right address? Is it associated with that organization they're claiming to be? And then do look up information. Go and search on your own and then try to compare what the email is saying. Then how do you know the website is secure? Click on the area that shows the site is secure. So you click on the URL up and then it will bring the details if 
the padlock is there, if the HTTPS is there, and then you can proceed from there. So which of these password is more secure? Now let's be interactive. They are like one, two, three, four. Yes, these four passwords. Please, by show of hands, which password is secure? Sogam, why are you not getting me, man? Yes, Alan, which password is secure? The third one. Okay, that's according to Alang Roba. I would say the last one is more secure. Okay, that's according to you, gentlemen. Tim? Yeah, I would say the second one. Second one, okay. Cecilia. Cecilia, yes. Cecilia. Okay, the third one is more secure. The third one. Okay. Uh, okay, what about the, the first one? Why is not, why is everyone not saying it? What's wrong with that cake? What's wrong with the first password? At the first password, somebody can just guess it if I, if I think beyond all you are what i what I'm, i thought maybe you use your password i can guess password and maybe put the bus of maybe put your bus date if it does not work i can just use password and if okay. not i can just okay. go to the to test it how long will it take for me to crack that password i will write oh, the yeah. password first and see how long will it take for me to crack you even know you will know about cracking not easy, man. Uh, all right. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stella. So, uh, so the, 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 the let's say the, 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 the passwords that we say from second to third, all of them are good. But the third one is the most secure because it is very long. Because it is very long. Uh, complexity, like length beats complexity. So length is better than complexity. A long one is hard to brute force than a short one, even though it is with all the, the numbers and the symbols and the capitalization inside. So the third one, cows, help, make cheese is the best, but second and third are also very good. So which is the best option to remember your password? Uh, notebooks stored in a safe place, if you know that maybe you will never have them access to someone else, yes. Stick a note on a computer, no. Use your first and last name, no. So what are the three things that indicate this is a scam? Can you, based on how I've explained on the previous indicators of scams? Yeah, 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 true, Stella. None of them is, you cannot use a notebook. First of all, it could get back or just get lost, then if not in the wrong hand and then you'll lose all the passwords if that's what you are relying on. So um, what are the three things that indicate this is a scam? According to this, look clearly. Yeah, give me three things that indicate this is a scam, please. 
So from the pharmacy date July, subject pharmacy points expiring. Important message for the pharmacy card, card holder, yes. To, to, to be sure you keep all your points that you have accumulated over the last shopping at the pharmacy, you must visit the link below to start using your points now or you will lose them forever. Yes, Atim? What is the first point to show that this is a scam? I think uh, the language, uh, like uh, when they say you must visit the link below to start using your points now or you lose them. That kind of language uh, pressuring you to do something that makes it suspicious. So Very good. that's the first point I got here. Roba? Uh, the name of the pharmacy is not specified. So which pharmacy are you talking about? Okay, but the pharmacy could be specified, assuming they specified the pharmacy. Okay. What will you do, assuming the, the, they specify the pharmacy? The language. The language is, is not appropriate, actually. Yeah, they're putting you under pressure or like yeah. a threat. That is a threat that you don't do this, this will happen. Yeah, the language. Yeah. So another way to identify that this is a scam, okay, this is a presentation, but if it is on your own email, and then you just, you can see the, the cursor, that is the arrow, arrow that is moving around the link, yeah? So yeah. it's called hovering. So if you're hovering around this link, you will hover around the link like this. You will, uh, you will know that they are that they are telling you in the message is not the same to what is showing down here. Here down at the bottom of your screen, you'll be seeing something different. Uh, someone say that pharmacy sells on prescription or any points. No, it could be it could be the it could be the promotion that they are giving to people who buy from them. So maybe if you're buying a lot of stuff, you hand points, and then maybe a certain number of points can buy you drugs. So that could not be the point, but the main thing here, the, the language that is uh, talking, that's being used, and then there is a link that is telling you to, uh, to visit. Then uh, you can also like, subject yeah that the subject is also saying that pharmacy points like they're trying to make the point clear at the start that can want to say something yes yes jack get cake uh, yes for me number one yeah. the pharmacy is not yeah, I the pharmacy. If I know that something of the pharmacy could like that, I will, I will hold on. Because I know I did not buy it. Number two, the sanity and the food, where is it? I don't know sanity. But so the three things I see from the email. What about this one? What about this one? From David John at geek 123 at geek.com. Adorable member, your request for the auto renewal of tech support has been proceeded successfully. This renewal service starts at 560 US dollars for the next two years on a protected service. Installation ID, that's it. Install software, tech support software. This date of request. Uh, ends on two years later. If you have any question, we are here for you. Oh, this one I can provide the email first because the solution company is supposed to be related using HTC. Uh, it is uh, uh, technology support. I think they can put the address. First, can they not address me? Okay, that's good. That's good. Now let's let's all do this, yeah. 
you receive an email telling you you have won a prize. You think it's a spam. What should you do? Reply and tell the sender to stop emailing you. Click the link to visit the website to see if it's trustworthy. Click and subscribe. Put in in your in spam folder or ignore it. Which one would you do? All these are actions. I can just ignore it because I know yeah. that you subscribe to this website. Yeah. How can they remind me? I will just ignore the list. Yeah, good. Another person? Another person? Another person? I would unsubscribe. Okay, no, it was, it's not also good. Put a spam folder, okay, nice. And then. So there are people who have been commenting or uh, making a request that uh, based on the emails that I just gave as example, that uh, the HTTPS is not there. So the phishing thing and the website are completely the website is when you are born to that website, yes? But the phishing one might actually be having uh, the HTTPS on it. I will do none of the above. So you will not even ignore. <laughs> because ignoring is part of the above, Stella. <laughs> so what will you do then? If you cannot ignore, you cannot subscribe, you can. <laughs> You'll follow the price. <laughs> okay, maybe you did not see ignore. You have said I will ignore. <laughs> so uh, another way to 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 test if if you have been sent uh, phishing links or uh, a document or uh, they're sending you a button to click uh, is usually, for example, if it is a link. Copy that link. Copying it does not mean you have opened it. You can copy it. Go. Oh, there is something called virus total. I am typing it in the. Virus total is a, a site that verifies if uh, the content of the link that has been sent to you is malicious. So you can see by that total. So you have sent something and you want to find out if it's actually, uh, if it is a uh, malicious or the link is taking you to a wrong site, please take it to virus total. Another way to avoid all this is use the right browser. Use the right browser. If you're using Chrome, Use Chrome and then add an extension like uh, DuckDuckGo or Red Privacy Oriented uh, extension like HTTPS Everywhere. So HTTPS Everywhere. Such that if you are send a link that is taking you to a site that is not secure and you have already clicked, your browser will tell you that this site is malicious. Do not go there. You get it. And then it will help you there. Another way is uh, you just start. Just Google the word virus total the way I've written it. You see it. But okay, let me bring. Let me bring the link. You have a point. Let me bring. You bring the 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 virus to the link.
So that is the link to buy Aristotle. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can get a browser that is secure if you're using Chrome add a, an extension to it a privacy oriented extension if you're using a so did I use some smart but if you're using an, a, a browser like a, If you're using a browser like uh, Firefox, then that one, it's automatic. It will help uh, you directly. It will just tell you uh, this site is not secure. If you're using DuckDuckGo as a browser, very good. If you're using uh, Brave. Okay, how does it work? You copy the link. If you open it, you will see there are three links below it one is you upload a file huh? you upload a file so if you open that link you'll see that there is where you upload the file yeah so when you upload the file okay stop share and let's say share Virus total. I'm going to share the link to virus total. Let's say uh, so let me share the screen of virus total as we're waiting for Vida. Mm, okay, yeah. Can you all see the screen? I have joined already. Okay. So you can see the, the virus total is here. Huh? So virus total analyze. Um, so virus total analyze. So you can see here is a file. Hmm? So if it is a file, you have already downloaded and you're suspicious about it, you can upload the file here. If it is a URL, a link, you can upload it here. And then if it is something that is not there and then you want to search, you can search for it. And then VirusTotal will uh, analyze it for you and it will tell you that this is suspicious. Please uh, take it down or I mean, remove it from your machine. So these are this is how VirusTotal works. So it's a file, it's a document, anything, you upload it. URL, you post it if you click URL. It will tell post the, the URL and then you can post it here. Like this is the URL for virus total that I posted in the chat earlier on. And then uh, maybe I don't have a file to upload right now, but if it is a file, you'll say choose a file that you want to upload and then it will come to your machine. So this is how uh, virus total works. Yes. So otherwise, that is all from me. Uh, I will share with uh, all of you, unless you have maybe any question before I go away. I'll share with you all the, uh, the, the, the documentation of the presentation that I just gave you. Otherwise, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unless you have a question before I hand it over to Peter. And about my face, I'll show my face. Yes, Alan. Yes, Lang. I hope you're not asking to show my face again. You promised that us that at the last we are going to see your I'll face. Show, I'll show not the, 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 the session is still going. I'll show my face. Don't worry. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. No more questions. In that case, I'm still around, by the way. So if there's something that maybe you didn't ask now, you can still ask later on. So yes, over to you, Vida. Yes, Vida.
Okay, um, are you getting me, Arik? Yes, I can get you. I am getting you and then you are quiet all of a sudden. Vida. Wow. Uh, all right. You're welcome. You're welcome, uh, Stella. Okay. Um, are you getting me, Eric? Yes, I'm getting you, Vida. Perfect. I had to change my internet connection because I've, uh, I've, I'm being knocked out every now and then. Oh, okay. Yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for the present. It was excellent. And I trust that most of the participants have gained insights into, yeah. into the topic that uh, we are talking about. <laughs> Keep up. <laughs> Someone said I could be for lunch. I'm not for lunch, mate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then uh, I have... I have put the link in the I have put the link for the attendance list in the chat box so that we are able to refund your internet data. Please uh, you write your MTN or Z number to which you want us to send uh, your airtime refund for for all of you. Please uh, fill the attendance. If you don't fill the attendance, we will not send you the the airtime refund. So um, Nancy, I hope. You are still in the call. You were earlier asking the where are the red flags. So actually, Arik, you make me a co-host. Uh, uh, Arik, are you getting me? Hey, Eric. No, um, Morbe, we need you, you have digital number. No, you put MTN. You put we, we, we really prefer MTN, but if you have Zane, there's no problem. Tak <laughs> Tak 
Okay, um, you're welcome on board. I've been able to fix the, the issue. I think I should now be able to share my screen. Um, The screen. Are you seeing my shared screen? Yeah, red flat. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so usually there are red flags when you come across uh, certain sort of information offline and online. We say that even though it can be tough to spot this information, there are some clear signs out there that can tell you to double check something before sharing it and or before taking it as fact and letting it impact your decisions. Surprisingly, one of the best clues lies in your feelings. You as a news consumer, when you see these red flags, it's time to, to take a bit and check the information out. One, if the information creates strong feelings such as surprise or disgust, it could be designed that way to get to believe and share it. For, for instance, the information shared on social media. Social media is designed to play with people's um, emotional intelligence. So when you, get, when you come across information that creates a strong feeling in you, you should really take your time to check out that particular information. And then if something that seems to confirm your opinion or worldview might be too good to do what? To be true. Yeah, sometimes there are certain, certain, we have certain, uh, certain things we believe about uh, a lot of issues. So, so when you get to sort of um, come across information that kind of similar to what you already believe in, then you are likely believe that and then it is it is what it is a red flag for you to really check that sort of information and then when the article has no date or author maybe and then this article is definitely what bogus especially if you come across online articles on websites and then viral post from an account that is not verified yeah when you usually people especially from media institutions people believe in media institutions that are verified mainstream media so when an account is unverified and it has created a viral post, we should be very careful. It means that it does not have a blue check mark next to the name. So it's suspect because they may not be who they say they are. So um, we should be, but also we should also know that a blue check mark just verifies someone's identity and it does not mean that the person is an expert or only tell the truth. We should also be very careful even if the account is verified. So these are red flags that you should look up to when you come across pieces of what information as a news consumer. And then I, I already explained the, these types of uh, information disorder earlier on. This is just a review that you should know that um, we have false and the intention to harm, where we have misinformation, which are unintentional mistakes, such as inaccurate photo captions, deaths, statistics, translations, or when satire is taken seriously. And then we have disinformation, which is fabricated or deliberately manipulated audio visual content, which is intentionally created conspiracy theories or rumors. And then we have malinformation, which is the deliberate publication of private information or personal or corporate rather than public interests, such as revenge porn, and which is also the deliberate change of context, date or time of genuine content. So this is mal information. So you may ask yourself, what drives misinformation? These points are going to be similar to what Arik already explained in the session on online safety. They are very related. One of the things that drive misinformation 
the information disorder, we say that uh, information disorder has the potential to polarize public opinion. It can promote violence. It can promote violence and hate speech, and ultimately can undermine democracies and reduce trust in democratic processes, which is motivated by several distinct factors. One of these factors is money making. You know, when, when people trick you into clicking on false sites, they can make money from advertisements. And sometimes even from, from the sort of engagements that they have with you, they can easily what, get money from you. So this is one reason why people do misinformation and disinformation campaign. Another one is for political gain. You know, politicians are accusations, counter accusations, like some of you who might have been following issues to do with the, the revitalized peace agreement, you will see the SPLMIO saying X, the SPLA saying Z, the, another group will say Y, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, confusion. And some of them, they are doing it intentionally. And this is because they want their parties to gain influence and to see that uh, people will have different judgments about them. So these political gains can be through creating smear campaigns, especially um, in places that experience elections and sort of that. And sometimes it's because of for social or psychological reasons. Like sometimes people push uh, false or misleading content because they want to see what people will think. They want to see what can these people see if we push out uh, this false content. And lastly, it is due to poor journalism. Uh, poor journalism is when, uh, you know, these days, media institutions want to sell their stories. So sometimes uh, in the event that they try to, to sell their stories, they don't check their facts. And this can be in the rush to be the first to break a story. And a lot of mistaking can be made, which, is, which if not corrected, can have potentially damaging consequences. So these are four, um, these are four factors that we have identified that really play a big role in driving the information uh, disorder. So another, th let, let's look at this. This is our sort of uh, political related stuff that is uh, written in the, in the Arabic language. And then uh, here, like you will see, some of you might, even if you have followed iRadio, this year iRadio has issued a lot of apologies. This is because uh, they have in some cases misquoted their sources or because they did not check their facts before publishing. Like you could see in this story, uh, iRadio misrepresented an excerpt from the press statements by the Minister of Water Resources and Irrigation when they erroneously attributed the signing of the river drenching to Vice President Dr. Waniga. So you see, so this is, this is a case of poor journalism where people are in the rush to be the first to break what? News. And it, can, it, it is a driver for, the, for information disorder. So what, what are the dangers? What are the dangers of, uh, of, of misinformation? First of all, you should know that fact-checking is very important in any industry, whether you are promoting a product or service, whether you're writing an opinion piece on a news story, it's always important that you get your facts right. And of course, regardless of your motivation, publishing in accurate reports can have catastrophic results. So what happens when unfounded claims and misinformation are reported as facts? So what are the dangers of this uh, publication of inaccurate reports? One, um, reputations of writers and even institutions can be damaged. Like now, if, if we see you as a media institution, credible media institution, and then you, beginning, uh, you begin sort, sort of misquoting your sources and uh, publishing inaccurate reports, definitely we are going to lose trust in you. We will not uh, pay really attention to detail in most of your reports uh, that you publish. So this is already a damage to your reputation as an individual or as a media entity. We say that a single mistake, no matter how small, could result in anything from losing your audience trust. Of course, when your reputation is gone, the trust of your audience is what? It's gone. And to, which is a key, of course, to you to become a target of an internet backlash or even legal repercussion. Yeah, sometimes when you damage someone's reputation in, in your reports or when you misquote someone, somebody can sue you to court and you can be what? I remember a case where a former minister of fi uh, finance, I think, had an issue with an opinion writer 
and they had to go to court and the person was sent to jail. You see, this is a legal repercussion that has come as a result of someone ignoring fact checking. So we see that it can also exploit and worsen existing ethnic, racial or religious divisions, which can lead to what? To violence. Like we have seen cases uh, previously where you hear that, hey, community, community A is uh, mobilizing against community B, or uh, this religion is saying X, Y, Z. So as a result of this already ex this exploitation and worsening of existing divisions that people have. And then in case of health crisis, um, it can worsen health crisis. Like we see COVID-19, uh, people have been ignoring vaccines and people have been ignoring even precautionary measures intended to slow the spread of the virus. So this is too bad. And then it can also lead to mistrust of facts and expertise. And when there's mistrust of facts and expertise, nobody knows what is true, and it can be terribly bad. So these are important dangers of misinformation, and all of us should, uh, should be very, very careful when we deal with the information so that we don't become contributors to an information ecosystem that is not healthy. So, yeah. So um, we are going, uh, this is just, it was supposed to be if we had continued earlier, but I hope all of you have filled the attendance. Is there anyone facing difficulties in filling the attendance? Uh, if you have just joined us, uh, the attendance list is here. Please fill in your attendance and uh, put the number to which you want us to send your airtime reimbursement. Very important. So, um, so how do we fight misinformation? Earlier on, most of you were asking this question. How do we fight misinformation? Already some of the tips are mentioned in the earlier session on online safety. So some of them are repeated. So what you can do is this. We say that whether the information comes from your neighbor or a stranger, whether the information is intended to harm or not, misinformation can have devastating consequences. And with so much at stake, you can see why it is important to fight misinformation. And of course, there's an easy way to fact check the, see, the things you see online. One of the things you should ask yourself, who is behind this information? Very important question. Ask yourself, who is behind this piece of information? You should be able to identify the origin of a particular news story. And then number two, you ask yourself, okay, if this information is from X, Y, Z, what is the evidence? What is the evidence to support the claims that are, being, um, that are being shared in the publication? So ask yourself, what is the evidence? Look at the sources. What are the sources saying? The sources quoted in the what? In the particular information, what are they saying? And then, um, then number three, you ask yourself, what are other sources saying about the same thing? For instance, if it is a news a story that is published by, by Radio Miraya, you can then go and check what is the city review reporting on this same issue? What is the number one citizen newspaper reporting on this same thing? What is our Juba TV or what is Hodin Juba saying about this thing? So you check other sources. And then after checking other sources, then you are able to weigh, you see, are they reporting the same thing? Then if, if most of these media institutions are reporting the same thing, then it is highly likely that this information is what is true because most of most of these media institutions report independently they reach out to their sources independently and then they put their, their their report together and then published so when you ask these three important questions then it can be one step towards helping you fighting uh, misinformation and uh, yeah so like we said earlier, you need to consider the sources, click away from the story to investigate the site, the mission and its con and the contact information of, you should be able to, to see that um, you, you sort of click away from the story, you investigate the website, the mission of the website, and you check out the contact information. Is there a way you are able to reach out independently to this website? And then you check the author. You can do a quick search on the author, whether they are credible or whether they are real. Yeah, for instance, on the story, if the story is published by Emmanuel Morbe, 
you do a Google search, who is Emmanuel Marbe? Of course, Emmanuel Marbe should be somebody, if he's a, if he's a genuine reporter, we should, should have data for instance. So when you sort of do a search on him, you should be able to get information about him. And then you also check the date, because reposting all new stories doesn't mean they are relevant to current events, yeah? You can sort of uh, check uh, whether the story is not old, which year was it published, because sometimes people share all the stories and then people tend to, to believe them. And uh, also you check your biases. You consider if your own beliefs could affect your judgment about a particular story. When you check your biases, it can help you. It can be a great deal to helping you uh, spotting real and fake news. And then always read beyond the headlines. I am glad earlier uh, someone said that what they do usually is they even get to go up to the comments to read. Yeah, like comments to really, when you read comments, like in the story, sometimes when you see a new story, you go to the comment section, you, you read, what are people saying? So sometimes they are factual information, even, or maybe they are even details that are not contained in the story, but you will find them in the what? In the comment section. So being able to check in the comment section and seeing what people say about a particular thing can be a great deal to helping you as a news consumer. And then you, you check the supporting sources. Click those links and determine if the information given actually supports the story. Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, go to the go and see what are the sources. Who did they quote? Did they quote the minister? Did they quote a report? If they quote the report, is there a link to the report? So you should be able to see that the sources are relevant to the particular news story. And uh, you also ask yourself, is it a joke? Yeah, because um, because sometimes uh, if it is too outlandish, it might be satire. And then what you need to do is you need to research the site and then the author that to be what to be sure about the particular uh, article. So these are. And then last thing is you ask an expert. You can ask um, somebody who is an expert in the area. If it's a health issue, ask a health expert. If it is an issue on education, ask an education expert. If it is an expert on law, ask a law expert. And they should be able to give you additional information uh, to support or to clear any doubts that you may have about uh, a particular report. So these are very important things uh, that you should take into consideration as we try to, to fight this, the information uh, disorder. And this can help you a lot in spotting real and fake news. So another thing is, like we said, you consider the sources, you investigate if it's on Facebook. On Facebook, uh, you go to About Us, like you see these pages, when you see um, Hodin Juba, they will claim this is the, their contact information is there, their phone number is there, their email, their location, their office location, you see the map here, you see? So you will be able to, and then you see the About Us, what is the description, what is the mission of this, of this new site, then these details will give you a lot. And if you need, you can sort of write them by email or you call them. So when you investigate sources like this, and then this, this can be a thumbs up for you, meaning that you are practicing good fact checking skills. And then yeah, also look at this. Also on, the, on, on Facebook, there's what you call transparency page. So in the transparency page, this kind of, you go and check where is this page being managed and um, who are, where, where, where are the people who are managing this page best? Because sometimes we have people who are based outside South Sudan and then they're perpetrating sort of propaganda about issues that are happening back home. So when you, when you check the transparency info of a particular Facebook page, then you can sort of get when, how many times the name of this page has, has changed. And also if you see that uh, a page's name has been changed very frequently, then that is something you should also I worry about, especially about the credibility of a particular news source. Yeah, you should also look at this. For instance, this is a website for France 24. You will see about us, about France 24, who we are. You see, you sort of give information that you can go and read. France 24 is X, Y, Z. You can read their policies. And then if you have any doubt, they have also their, co their contact, contact page.
Yeah, not getting you, sir. Oh, we do. We are not getting it, sir. Um, I was kicked out of the call. <laughs> My network has been bad. Are you guys getting me clearly? <laughs> yeah, we're getting it. Okay, okay. Uh, I have to again, I have to again reconnect. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> This meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being recorded.
Okay. Are you guys getting me clearly now? Yeah, we're getting you. Yes. Okay, okay. I'm seeing people saying that they have not registered their attendance list. Vicky, here is the form. Please click on that form and you should be able to register your attendance. Um, yeah, use that form. This was where we stopped, right? Are you all seeing the screen? Yes, I can see the screen. Perfect. Good. So we say that you should be able to investigate the sources, like uh, most credible sources. For example, in this case, we have France 24. It has uh, the About Us page, About France 24, where you can read who they are and some of the policies that they subscribe to as a credible media institution. So these are things that you should look up to for sources of information that you come across before you share any piece of content. So uh, you can check the author by doing a simple Google reverse image search. I will show you that later. And uh, yeah, so of course, uh, the fact checking criteria, you should always make sure that you select, you set the claim clearly identifying who made the claim, um, where and when it was published and the context it was published in. You should find the evidence that proves or disapproves the claim, preferably from multiple sources. You should check the evidence for authenticity and rely on experts for input. Check the claim against the available evidence. This is especially for now fact checkers, people who are looking to be professional fact checkers. When you are writing a particular fact check, you should be able to, to make sure that uh, you state your claim clearly, identifying who made the claim, when and when it was published, and the context it was published in. You should find the evidence by doing research. Uh, most fact checking practices we ensure that we use information that is readily available in the public domain, and you do less of interviews where you reach out to sources. And uh, you need to check the evidence for authenticity. Any evidence that you get, you need to check to make sure that it is authentic and it does not in any way going to disapprove your fact check. And then check the claim. Again, it's available evidence. And you need to counter check against any potentially contradictory claims. Yeah, because at sometimes claims might be conflicting. So they can not be easy for your audience to be able to discern which one is which. So when you're able to kind of read that, uh, then that should be uh, very helpful to you as a fact checker. So uh, fact checking tips, fact checking is performed by anyone other than writers and editors. And obviously professional journalists do their best to present valid information to their audiences. I'm glad we have uh, some journalists in the room so uh, they know what they, what, what they usually do. They make sure that they try their best to present valid information to their audiences. And we say that one unfounded claim can quickly lead to a wave of misinformation. But of course, mistakes still happen from time to time. We cannot run from mistakes. Some of these things, like we said, are mistakes. And then if you don't have any fact-checking processes in place, it is now more important. It is important now more than ever to change that. If you are somebody who has not been practicing fact-checking, 
when you get out of this room, you should be able to put uh, fact checking processes uh, in place. And you can go to 211check.org or you can have a list of other credible news sources and they can be a great resource for, for, for checking the validity of a story. So it's always a good idea to use that before putting pen to paper, especially if the fact you have read sounds a bit what off. And uh, 211 check has a community of fact checkers where we discuss a lot of issues, especially to do with uh, this on a WhatsApp platform. Uh, as for those who are new here, I think we, sh we should be able to share the link later. And if you're very interested in carrying on with this conversation beyond this training, you should be able to join us there. And then you should also verify numbers, even the ones that are provided by clients, because it is recommended that you thoroughly check uh, your sources, thoroughly check your sources. It's very important. And um, also there needs to be processes put in place that enable editorial teams to produce both quick turnaround and long-term items of content ensuring, for ensuring factual credibility. And then for media organizations, the need to be seen and respond quickly to unfolding events has created a healthy notion that it's better to ask for forgiveness than seek for, for approval, but to what cause? Yeah, so this one is an example of people, of media institutions issuing apologies every now and then. This was because they feel that there's a need to, to, to respond quickly to unfolding events. But this is already an unhealthy notion. Uh, but it's they, because they believe that it's better to ask for forgiveness than seek for approval, which is not cool. So if you don't have the resources to create content that is not misleading, then you should not be creating content. This is one thing. And uh, if you feel that you can really create content that is not misleading, then you have to put in the resources. This is a very important point. If you don't have the resources to create content that is not misleading, you shouldn't be creating content. It's okay to make a mistake, but you should not take shortcuts that will ruin your reputation as an individual or as an, as an entity. And then make, we should make sure that we follow a checklist to ensure all necessary information is verified, to ensure you have thoroughly checked the most crucial information in your content before an article is published. And uh, examples of fact-checking successes, these are articles that, pub that are published by 211 Check. Some of you who might, have, uh, who might be reading 211 Check articles from time to time. Um, yeah, so this was, when you see this, this was the time when uh, somebody posted these photos that these are members of national security confiscated ammunition, which, is the trans which were being transported to people. At that time, of course, there was sort of uh, a fight, some sort of conflict there, and it wasn't true. So when we, when we, did, a, when we did an investigation through a reverse image search, uh, we, it was shown that these photos in, were inserted from 2016, and they were circulated in Nigeria, depicting a massive amount of weaponry and ammunition alleged to be concealed in a casket. But uh, it was falsely reported that the Nigerian army had interrupted an arms trafficking syndicate between these states, and uh, so when we did, when we did our, we found that this even it, the the situation it was circulated in Nigeria wasn't true, because a Nigerian army spokesperson said the photos were taken from a training exercise held in 2012, and it is normal to have other security agencies represented in all internal security trainings at schools or you see. So we sort of investigated this and we found that it wasn't true, and uh, so this is an example. And then uh, we have another one here. So we have another claim here where somebody posted on Facebook that going to the sauna can cause infertility in men. Your balls are not designed for that kind of temperature. So, um, so sauna is sort of, I know some of you know this, you can go and check your dictionary to check this. And then, so what happens is uh, this person posted that going to the sauna in men is this, this, this. And, um, and, and then when we reached out to medical practitioners, they were saying that it is not proven, 
but it is believed that going to, to the sauna for hot tubs and hot baths can raise the temperature of the testes, which can kill sperms and lowering sperm count. But uh, lowering sperm count does not mean uh, like you can become infertile. So, so we wrote, we made this and just a simple search and reaching out to a few people and that came out with this what? With this report. And uh, we have this also here. So we have this also, this was reported by the Don newspaper at that time where they say that 30 IDPs from Tambora die of hunger in Ezo County. So we had to look at, look at this newspaper and uh, they reported this and what happened was uh, we had to call the commissioner at that time and we had to look at media reports from at that time, media reports from Miraya, what was the media report saying? And uh, we had to contact the RRC and then get to get some, some information about uh, this particular headline, which at that time was false. So these are some examples of, of time of, of, uh, of things that, uh, that we have done, especially when it comes to information uh, verification. We are not getting us on your mute. Okay. I was saying that these are just questions that later on you can go and reflect on. Um, you need to ask yourself, how serious is the problem of misinformation, false claim and fake news? What steps do you take to ensure you don't publish or share misinformation, false claim and fake news? Have you, like some of you in your different work that you do, has somebody come back to you that, hey, looks like, Something here does not add up in a particular report that you wrote. This means that your content has factual errors. So how best can we avoid spreading misinformation and other fake news? So that brings us to the end of our, our, my presentation for today. And uh, we are just exactly at 12.27 and we're supposed to end at 12.30. So uh, please ensure that you have all filled your attendance for, to, for this session. I'm seeing uh, uh, 12 people have failed attendance. I see Leju, I see Ajo Nelson, I see Koma, I see Atem, I see Kajokare, I see Jack, Jack Dick, I see a Low John, I see Emmanuel Morbe, I see Stella, I see Kay Emmanuel, I see Malwal Peter, I see a Leng Vicky. So it means that uh, there are some people here who have not filled the attendance. Um, please fill your attendance. Roba, the attendance is here. Roba, the attendance is here. Just below your comments, click on that link. Um, yeah. If you have any questions, please ask. Um, now the fact-checking tools will be another session for another day. Um, we'll, we, we, we start, so the next series, the next training will be, will handle fact-checking tools. I think we'll have that next week. Next week we'll have a session on fact-checking tools also for Protecting tools and data security and digital rights, sorry. So, um, Malwal, have you really seen? It looks like I've not seen your name in the attendance. Uh, Malwal, your name is there. Um, yeah. Yes, um, any question? Otherwise, our time is up. <coughs> Yeah. You raise your. I want to know. All right. <laughs> you need to raise your. There's a there's a feature for raising your hand. Yes, um, James Atem. Yes, I, I just want to know when will be the next session, the, the exact date. For for the session on on fact checking tools. Yes. On Thursday. On Thursday next week. Thursday. We want to give enough time, yeah, enough time for registration. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. So I hope that all of you now have a better understanding of 
information disorder, fact checking tips. Yes, Leju Oliver, I see your hand is up. I'm not getting you, Leju. Leju, I am not getting you. Okay, then, guys, uh, please feel the attendance. And uh, thank you all for joining this call. I wish you the very best of your afternoon. It's lunchtime. And, uh, and uh, Estella, thank you for, Ida. for uh, joining. Yes, please, Eric. Those that wanted to see my face, have they gone? <laughs> no, 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 they are still here. You can put on your camera. <laughs> yeah, I keep promising, huh? Yeah, we're yeah. still around. Yeah. You can show them your face now. <laughs> Are you seeing him now? <laughs> yeah. So this is this is the guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are seeing him. Are you seeing him? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, some, perfect. Some of them know me here, but uh. Yeah, but there are, there are a lot of them.